Hello, and welcome to Based on a True Story, the podcast that compares your favorite Hollywood movies with history. Today, we're going to be learning about the 2008 movie Defiance. The movie is based on Nahama Tech's book of the same name. Nahama's son, Roland, was the co-producer on the movie. And today, Roland will be joining us to separate fact from fiction in the film. Now, before we connect with Roland, though, it's time to set up our game, Two Truths and a Lie. If you're new to the show, here's how it works. I'm about to say three things. Two of them are true, and that means one of them is an all-out lie. Are you ready? Okay, here they are. Number one, there was not a fight between Tuvia and Zeus that drove the brothers apart. Number two, crossing the swamp took a lot longer than we see in the movie. Number three, the Jews and the Russians did not work together at all like we see in the movie. Got them? Okay, now as you're listening to our story today, your challenge is to find the two facts scattered somewhere throughout the episode, and by a simple process of elimination, you'll know which one is a lie. And of course, we'll do a recap at the end of the episode to see how well you did. All right, now it's time to connect with Roland Tech about the historical accuracy of Defiance. The movie starts with some text setting up the situation. It's the year 1941, and Germany has occupied Belorussia. This is when we meet the four Bielski brothers. Tuvia, played by Daniel Craig, Zeus, played by Liev Schreiber, Asuel, played by Jamie Bell, and the youngest brother, Aaron, played by George McKay. Since the movie doesn't really explain much about what it was like before Germany invaded, can you fill in some more historical detail about what life was like for the Jews in Belarus before the timeline in the movie? Uh, well, actually, at that time, it was Poland, of course. Just to be clear, Belarus right, wasn't independent at that time. That area was really, you know, shifting back and forth a lot during the time uh, after the First World War between Russia, Poland. And in fact, Lithuania was given independence in a sort of pact between Hitler and Stalin. Anyway, all of that is to say that the Jews in that area were a minority who it kind of depended on where you where you were, you know. In certain uh, urban set settings, uh, they uh, had a certain kind of a, a status. But of course, this is more in the countryside where this takes place. Um, and so the Bielskis were, they were farmers, they were peasants, and they were very much like they fit in with uh, the whole community at large. And it was really what I think we we know is, uh, is that in general, as the war uh, took over, it was kind of like these divisions became more exaggerated. Um, in, in other words, um, people who had been friends and who had been uh, business partners, suddenly uh, the fact that uh, one family was Jewish and the other was not uh, became important where it maybe had not seemed as important before. I think we can probably now, uh, we can understand sort of what that's like a little bit living uh, in the time we live in now when these divisions are becoming <laughs> sort of more important. So they did business, uh, they, they uh, were farmers, so they were uh, you know, doing business and then with uh, the local community. And then all of a sudden, everything changed. I mean, that was sort of the nature of that, that time period, you know? Well, according to the movie, we see the, the cops in town helping to round up the Jews. I think there was a line of dialogue where it says, in exchange, the Germans paid 500 rubles for each person that they turned over. So those that were able to escape found their way to the nearby forest. And that's when we see the, the four brothers and they're just, just more and more people just start showing up. So that's kind of how the movie explains that they're forced to stay out of the towns and the reason why they set up a camp in the forest in October of 1941. Is that a pretty accurate way of showing how and why the camp started? Okay, so, so you c kind of have to understand that they were very familiar with these forests, right? Because they were living alongside these forests. So it wasn't necessarily like an idea, 
let's go set up a camp in the forest. It was more, let's run away from danger where we can hide. And then when you're hiding, then it's sort of like, oh, in fact, there's a scene in the film where in a kind of woodsy area, watching their house, they're kind of looking at the kind of uh, destruction that has fallen on the house. Of course, this reflects really what the kind of relationship was with the forest. They, they could go in and out of the forest. And because they were familiar with the area, they were able to hide and then were able to create some kind of a a camp. But um, it's sort of like, it's an evolution, really, what happened. It's sort of like one thing leads to another. It's like, first you're camping out, then you realize you're hungry, then you have to get some food. You You go to a farmer who you know, and you get some food, and someone who you trust, maybe. Then maybe, you know, as that more people hear about that you're that that you're in the forest, they try to find, you know, where are you, then you maybe have to leave because somebody you know, uh, gives away your location, you know, so this is a, it's a kind of a natural evolution, but, it, but it's as in all things in life, really, I mean, it's not, it's not so planned out in advance, but you sort of look up one day and realize, oh, we have a camp in the forest, you know, that's sort of a natural kind of a slow evolution, I would say. And uh, Tuvia Bielski was unusual in this regard, because of course, the other people in the forest were uh, the Russian partisans, right? Now, the Russian partisans had a mandate from Stalin. They were, they were actually supplied by the Russian government, and they were there for one purpose and one purpose only, which was to wreak havoc with the German offensive, right? But to Vyabelsky, it was a more complicated thing for him, you know, and slowly over time, he became uh, really um, concerned mostly with just saving lives and so took on as you see in the film, took on women and children and old people, which is something the Russian partisans would not have done. You know, in the Russian partisans, usually if somebody wanted to join a Russian partisan group, well, they had to be male usually, and um, they, had to, they had to have a gun. So, you know, so it's a very different situation. I want to ask you about something that really stood out to me in the movie where they mentioned that there were like, 3,000 Jews in town just a couple days ago, and now there's 50. The movie doesn't go into a lot of detail about this, but um, like I mentioned earlier, talking about the the law enforcement rounding people up, but also talking like local townspeople just turning on their own neighbors. Was that something that the Germans were able to use the local people there to basically turn on their neighbors? Well, you have to understand that this, of course— in every village, every town, there were different situations. Um, you couldn't, you can't, it's very difficult in the Holocaust to generalize about things like this. But it just so happens that, um, for example, in Lithuania, where, you know, Vilna was, cons- Vilna, Vilnius or Vilna, the capital of Lithuania, was referred to before the war as the Jerusalem of Lithuania, right? So, and in fact, when the Germans invaded Poland and Lithuania was suddenly once again an independent state, Jews flooded into Vilnius or Vilna thinking they were, they were going, because Lithuania was a neutral country at that point, um, and thinking they were getting into a safe haven. Vilna was, it was seen as a safe place. So many Jews poured in from all sorts of other directions seeking safety. And then, of course, surprise, surprise, it turned out, if we look back, that some of the most enthusiastic uh, collaborators with the Germans were uh, Lithuanians. But again, not, you can't, it's very difficult to generalize. There were many cases where is depicted in the film where police would go side by side or they would be working on behalf of the Nazis. But um, there were also cases of, as you see in the film too, of people who who fought against it, who worked in with the underground, who tried to sabotage the Germans. And uh, so, but you had to be, you know, uh, it, you could sort of never never quite know, you know, who who is going to be 
who is going to be a collaborator? Who might denounce you? If, if a family was hiding, let's say, in a barn somewhere, they had to be very cautious about who could know that they were there. And it could be, as is also depicted in the film, I think quite accurately, that a husband and wife might even not know, do I trust my husband to, to keep the secret or vice versa? This was a, a very uh, terrible... <laughs> difficult time, and uh, people were denounced. And also, of course, you know, the Germans practiced, they would they would pay, so, so they used money to encourage the local population to denounce Jews or to, to help them find Jews that were in hiding. They also practiced, as you know, collective responsibility. So if, uh, if uh, Gentiles were found to be harboring Jews, there was uh, no exception. The death penalty. They were. They would be killed if they. So it was a huge risk to do that. So, um, and in fact, there were cases. This doesn't isn't depicted in the film, but there were there were some cases where there was one case, especially I don't remember the name of the village, but where an entire village was killed for harboring Jews. They were they were rounded up and they were put. It's actually in the book Defiance. She describes it. Nahama Tech, my mother, descri- describes this, where they were put into a church and the church was burned to the ground with all these people in the church. So, yeah, so it was a, ve- uh, it took tremendous courage um, to resist. So, any resistance should be taught and um, we should remember, you know, it's, I think it's very important for us to remember that there were people who resisted. It's, it's, a, it's very important, especially for, to teach this in schools, that kids should know that no matter what injustice is sweeping the land, there are always some people who follow their own moral compass. It's very important. I think that's an important message of the film and the book. There was the husband and wife in the movie where he helps he helps them. I think he's the first one to give them a food and, and a gun. Yes, Koschik, uh, the farmer. And that's sort of an amalgam. I mean, it's sort of based a little bit on a, tr- a real character in the book, but it's also Ed Zwick kind of combined a few elements from a few different actual people to make that character in the film. His wife, knowing, knowing, you know, he he's killed and she still helps. I think that was just was very, very moving. That's actually an interesting moment with that wife in in the film because she wasn't happy that he was helping. She resented it because, of course, it was uh, dangerous, and she worried, of course, that he would be killed. And then after he's killed, she still sort of helps them uh, in a way. It's a, it's a, it shows you the complexity of the situation. You know, n- not all good, not all bad. You know, she did what she could in the moment. Well, you mentioned earlier that people kind of knew about this camp as it was starting to be set up. I mean, I wanted to ask you about that, and because a lot of movies, they'll compress the timeline a lot. And it seems to happen pretty fast that we see some people coming into the forest and like, oh, you know, we're, we're looking for the, for the Bielski camp, right? Like they knew that it was there. How fast did that happen? So you're making a, a 90 or to 100 minute film, right? So of course, everything is going to be compressed. And actually, the film only covers the first part, like the first year in the forest. So yes, there there was compression done to try to show, but but I think uh, what Ed Zwick did so well in the film, in the screenplay, and in the directing so well was show how you see people who hear rumors right about the Bielskis, and and if they're lucky, they find them. Again, keep in mind that a lot of these people were people who were city people; they were not they were not familiar with the forest. So it was almost a miracle if they managed to find their way to this place. And uh, you see in the film how over time, the people who wander up to the camp, you can see one woman is wearing a fur coat, you know, a man is carrying a fancy suitcase, because these were city people who grabbed the most valuable belongings they could. You know, I think you even see in one shot in the film, somebody's holding, you know, um, like a, a, man- a fancy silver menorah or something. You know, like people grab what they can. So basically they're wearing on their backs whatever they have to survive, you know. 
Yeah. So it, uh, I thought it did a very good job of showing the, the, the stark contrast between these urban city people arriving at this camp and then the people who are already in the camp already sort of look like they've been living in the forest, you know, so there's a strong contrast between that. Oh, you, men- you mentioned earlier that because they were living um, near the forest, they were accustomed to going in and, and coming out. So I wanted, I wanted to ask you about what you were just saying there with some people being in the city. Were there more, more people that were like the Belskis that knew the forest and kind of knew that area, or would it be that most of them were coming from cities? I think it was a combination. I think there were some people who were, yeah, it was a, a real combination of of people with different backgrounds. Now, of course, it's a- uh, accurate in the film because uh, in the book it's also described how when somebody would arrive or when a group of people would arrive, they would basically be, you know, try they w- the the people who were already in the camp would be looking to these new arrivals like, what skills do you have? Do you, you know, uh, can you cook? Can you fix a watch? Are you a nurse? I mean, you know, and oftentimes, you know, there there were people, nurses, doctors. If you were a nurse or a doctor, that was a fantastic um, help because, of course, nobody was going to be going to the hospital. So, um, and you know, there were also, this is not in the film, but in the book, you know, there were um, abortions were had to be performed. There were abortions performed in the forest. I, th- I think in the movie, um, Tuvia has a rule that there can't be any kids right was that something that they they, for that reason because they didn't really have a hospital or i assumed it was they didn't want the noise yeah i mean i think yeah i think it's also yeah it's just very dangerous i mean to have an infant in the forest i mean there were cases of women who did who did give birth so there were both but yeah one thing that you had mentioned earlier were the russian partisans and in the movie as more people are coming, it means more mouths to feed. But that also means that there was kind of a disagreement between Tuvia and Zush where he thinks that uh, – Tuvia thinks that uh, we can provide for these people. We want to help these people. But then Zush gets mad and, no, there's too many people, and he wants to go off and fight. So he actually joins the the Russian partisans. Was there really a disagreement between the two brothers where that Zush went off to fight with the Russian partisans? No, that's that's actually a way in which the film kind of takes an issue, which was an issue that existed in the forest in general, and dramatizes it as being between the two brothers. But it really, in in real in real life, it wasn't really between uh, Tuvia and Zush. But there were, particularly as the group grew larger and larger and larger, and there were more and more elderly and young and you know not fighters there was a group of fighters who you know men with guns who went to tuvia and they were saying complaining kind of because they would have to hike several kilometers to try to look for food and then bring food back and they were feeding they felt they were feeding you know these people who were not who were useless they didn't have guns they weren't fighting and uh that was a source of tension and so that's depicted in the film as a tension between the two brothers. Um, but uh, but that tension definitely wasn't necessarily between the two brothers, but it was definitely something that Tuvia had to contend with. And then, of course, it's also depicted, I think, quite quite well and vividly in the film what it would have been like for these Jews to go to the Russian partisans, because there was a tremendous amount of anti-Semitism in the Russian partisan units. So when Jews did come to the Russian partisans, they sort of, if they had guns and they were going to fight with them, they would accept them to a certain degree, but there was always a way in which they were never quite fully integrated. And I think that's captured quite beautifully in the film, accurately. What of the the relationship that we see between the Russian partisans and the, the Bielskis, the way, the way the movie shows it, there's almost there's like almost this cooperation going on where the Russians are fighting against the Germans, they're ambushing them, you know, blowing up the train tracks, and then the Jews in the camp are helping to support the Russians by mending their clothes and helping them get supplies and things like that. That was absolute. That was true, and that that actually, and again, Tuvia Bielski can be credited for that. He was a brilliant kind of uh, negotiator and brilliant kind of 
in terms of reading people. And he had a special relationship with one of the Russian commanders. I forgot the guy's name, but it's in the book. Um, and he, whenever there was a conflict, whenever there was a, a problem coming up, Tuvia managed, managed to negotiate it and kind of work it out because he was, he was very clever that way that he made, he really made their unit indispensable to the Russians because they were doing these things for them, mending things um, and uh, other things like that. So, yeah, he was very clever that way. And he was shrewd, but he was also charming. He was very, he was sort of universally liked. So it was a really, uh, I don't know that any other person could have ne necessarily ended up saving 1,200 Jews the way that he did because he had this gift. He he could be tough, he could fight, but he also uh, could be uh, intuitive and read people very well, and he was a good negotiator. One thing that uh, we see throughout the movie is the camp changes you know, in initially, when they first go into the forest, it's, you know, we got to stay on the run or stay on the move. And, you know, we're not going to stay in a, a single place. And then towards the end of the movie, it's like a little town. They, you know, it's all wooden buildings and they're not going to be moving very much. Um, of course, we'll get to the scene where they do. But how did the movie do showing the camp's kind of progression? Let me tell you that when Nahama, when my mother visited the set, I was really it was very moving to me also because she was completely overwhelmed by the level of detail one of the things that i think is so strong about her book is that she did such copious research that she really described in the book in incredible detail how they managed to how what it looked like how they functioned how they fixed things how they cooked how they did medical things all of those things are really she really describes them in such detail and so the day that i brought her to the set and she saw dan wiles set that he built and and it's just like it's almost like details from her book came to life in that camp that they built. And so that was very moving for me to see her, you know, she was very excited and she couldn't, almost couldn't believe it, like the detail um, that was everywhere she turned. And that was pretty wonderful. One thing though, you know, is that of course the movie is compressing time and yes, they built something like a village in the middle of the forest, but uh, at least a couple of times they had to just abandon it and move and find another place and build from scratch again. So that was a reality of the of what happened. And in fact, what in the film is maybe a couple of minutes going through the swamp was actually, I think, seven days they were walking through this big swamp. It was a huge swamp, which you can see on a map. If you look at that forest, there's a you can see where the big swamp is. And seven days going through the swamp, they had to actually tie themselves they used their belts to tie themselves to trees to sleep so they wouldn't drown in the swamp. So that wasn't depicted in the film, but, you know, I mean, if you're going through a swamp for seven days, yeah, it was kind of amazing what they did. There's a scene in the movie where um, there's a German soldier that gets captured and he's taken into the camp and everyone just starts beating him. And, you know, they're, they're, crying out the names of, of their family members that have died at the hands of the Nazis. Did that sort of thing happen? That is actually based on a, a true, a really upsetting uh, thing that did happen. Yeah, there was a case. I think it's described in the book. And uh, it's, again, one of those things that it's confusing and upsetting that uh, when when you discover that even you can become a kind of animal, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's the kind of thing that I just can't imagine being in that sort of situation. It's kind of like with, with the, the, the farmer's wife. You'd like to think that you'd, you'd do the right thing, but I mean, I can't even imagine being in that sort of a situation and having to make that kind of a decision. Right. Well, I mean, um, I know my mom, you know, she interviewed hundreds of, of rescuers and um, also survivors. 
uh, in her research, not only for Defiance, but for all of her books. And she says that sometimes, you know, she would express amazement at what somebody did at how dangerous it was and how someone really risked everything to save a life. And that oftentimes they would look at her and say, well, you would have done the same thing. You would have been the same. And she said, honestly, she didn't know, you know, she had to be honest that like she, she hoped she would have behaved that way. But until you're in the situation, you really can't know, you know? Well, when they do have the German soldier, that tips them off to a German attack coming. And this is when in the movie, we see them leaving the camp. There's planes coming in, bombing. The infantry moves in. There's a group that stays with some armed men and women that stay, kind of stays behind to slow down the German uh, assault. Uh, and then Tuvia leads everyone else away through the, through the swamp. Uh, how much of the way that the movie depicts that was accurate? I know you're saying the timeline was very different, but just the way that the Germans came in and staying behind and defending. Right. That's a little bit like made a little bit more dramatic for motion picture. You know, <laughs> there wasn't exactly bombs falling on them and them, you know, like fighting that way. But there was definitely, there was a German offensive into the, the forest. There was a time when the Germans decided they were going to wipe out the partisans. And, but of course, that was Germans deciding they were going to wipe out all the partisans, right? So they weren't just thinking about the Jewish partisan. They probably, they, it was mostly Russian partisans, right? And so there, what, when they knew that uh, they were coming to that forest, they had to go deeper into the forest, which was when they went through that swamp. And they ended up on an island. I don't remember the name of the island, but it was an island in the middle of the swamp, which was a place where they could not be, they would not be caught by the Germans there because it was so deep into this swamp. It was impenetrable, and nobody would have ever found them there. But the problem was then they found themselves on this island, and they started starving. There was no, there was no food, so they had to eventually send people off the island to go try to find food. And then eventually they realized they had to come to the realization that they could not just stay there. They had to keep moving, and they had to get out of the swamp. Otherwise, they would all just starve to death. I mean, it was safe from the Germans, but, you know, they would starve there. And I'm sure that didn't help the tensions going on either. If people were already upset about having to go get the food and, and bring it back, now you have to leave an island too, and it's even even more difficult. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. But the one thing is, Tuvia was, um, he was, um, he was a strong leader, and he he would listen to a certain point, but then he, he would make a decision. He, he didn't have trouble making a decision and making it clear what the decision was. Well, in the movie, after they cross the, the swamp, they seem like they're, they're reaching the other side and, and it's all good. And then uh, there's soldiers there and there's a tank there and, and stuff like that. So they're kind of forced to stand and fight. How well did the movie do showing the battle between the Germans and the partisans? Well, the movie is very dramatic and it's very exciting. And, um, but, um, you know, in reality, as we know, I mean, actually it's, uh, anytime there's a, a fight, a fight between a tiny group of people and a whole army, which is what really it would be, right? Between the German army and like a, a, a few hundred partisans, it's a asymmetrical warfare, right? So what does that mean? So what that means is, the small group cannot be engaged in a direct battle with the army. It's an impossible. There would there they would it would be a suicide mission. So the quote unquote fighting is is just little acts of sabotage, like go in, blow something up, and run away, or cut off uh, telegraph wires or something like that. So it would be like specific um, things to disrupt. Uh, the the smooth functioning of the actual big military, but they couldn't really engage them in direct hand to hand combat. That's not; it's just Im an impossibility. I mean, they would have just been destroyed in five seconds. So, was that then mostly the the Russian partisans? Well, the Russian partisans also was small little things because they were also small groups. It's not like a typical 
kind of a warfare. Actually, you know what? It's um, very much like the American Revolution, right? There was the British army and then we were like disrupting and George Washington would be retreating across the river because he wanted to save the few soldiers he still had alive before he could figure out another way of sabotaging. How does it eventually work that the big army is defeated by these small little groups? It's because the big army eventually gets tired after three years or whatever it is. They just they just are exhausted from this constant, but it's it's in and out. It's quick little bits of sabotage. It's not really like two armies fighting the way we think of it, you know. Yeah, I like your your analogy there with the American Revolution. <laughs> <laughs> I mean it's you use what you have, you know, whatever you can do. I mean, if you have to burn a bridge to keep them from coming across, you do that, you know, whatever, whatever it is. Do we know from the German side? It sounds like, I mean, if they were, were doing an offensive into the forest, maybe they they did enough of those little things to to annoy them enough. Yes, that's right. So the Germans, the Germans had a, at a certain point, they had an idea. We've we've got to clear this forest, but they didn't really know what they were in for. They kind of got in deeper than they expected i guess okay can you give a little geographical context around the the forest and the swamp and for someone who's not familiar with that area like how large was the forest i think there's a it looks massive from the movie this is a now it's in belarus but you know then it was poland and um it's a a huge area a vast area i mean so vast that i mean just the fact that you could it could take seven days to cross a swamp gives you an idea of how big it big it is yeah now, at the very end of the movie there is some text that explains that they lived in the forest for two more years they had a new camp that had a school a hospital a nursery and by the war's end 1200 had survived can you fill in some more historical context around what happened after the movie's timeline well the movie condenses a little bit because I think actually that uh, the traveling through the swamp may have been technically after the time period of the movie. So I, it gets a little murky there. But I would say, generally speaking, it was just a slow expansion over time. The group got larger and larger and larger as more people found their way to them miraculously over time. And so in the end, when I think for them... They knew the war was over when the Russian soldiers were liberating that part of the world, you know, because, of course, in some places there were American GIs, but where they were, I think it was Russian soldiers who were liberating them. So then, of course, people tried to go, some people, you know, some people tried to go back to where they were from to find people. You know, there was a period of time when at the end of the war, people were looking for relatives that they had lost trying to find out of course nine most of the time you found out nothing or you found out that they were dead but it was uh and so you know finding out nothing usually meant that they were dead but some people did find each other and then the the bielskis of course tuvia ended up in the united states and was uh, a truck driver was he the leader throughout the entire thing yes that was never, there was never a question of that, really, except for those few guys who wanted to kind of have a mutiny because they were fighting. And the, there was one guy, I don't remember his name, but he had to be exiled because he was really threatening a mutiny. But it was pretty clear. I mean, f for the whole time, it was, yeah, it was Tuvia who was in charge. And his brothers never, this is a way, a way in which the film is a little bit different than reality. The brothers never really questioned that at all. Overall, from the the movie, was there anything that didn't make it into the movie that you wish had been in there? Not really. I have to say, I really am still, you know, when I look at the film after all these years, I'm still really impressed with how Ed was able to really capture the essence of what it was like and the and what we were talking about that that transition from just sort of camping out in the woods because the woods would be safe and you kind of feel safe there. And then actually thinking, well, it's raining, let's build something. He, I think he did a really marvelous job of capturing those details. And it's very difficult to take a book 
you know, her book is, I think it's an, I don't know, you've read the book, I think. Have you read the book? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think it reads very well. It's very well written and it's, it's, an, it's a page turner, but it's very dense with a lot of information. And I'm really impressed with how, how he was able to take that and make it into a 90 minute uh, film. It's incredible. But no, I don't, I don't think there were things that were left out. I think it's, it really gives you a sense of how this happened um, and what it was like, what it was like for people and the social dynamics. I mean, one of the interesting things in the book, and it is also portrayed, I think, quite beautifully in the film, is the way in which people who were upper class were now kind of on the bottom and people who had been peasants or lower class before the war were now on the top because naturally in the forest to survive those skills that they had were in much more valued than um you know like the skills of a philosophy professor <laughs> for example right i don't know how well i would do in the forest <laughs> i do, but hopefully i'll never find out <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, ho- hopefully we never have to find out, that's for sure. <laughs> well, since you were involved in the production of the movie itself, do you have a favorite story from on set or you know what, what that was like? I don't know. I think one thing that was funny was that we were filming in Lithuania and it was, I think we filmed until right before Christmas or something. Um, and so it was never the coldest, really, that, um, that it is there in that forest. And we were all remarking because, you know, you, you have a 12 hour day out in the forest shooting. And I remember, you know, we were all commenting the whole time how it was amazing how we were freezing. And there we were with our mittens and um, boots. And then we even had these warming things that you can put in your boots to keep your feet warm and everything like that. And we were complaining that we're freezing and thinking like we haven't even reached the dead of winter yet. And uh, it's hard for us. I can't imagine. I mean, it was just really, uh, inc- I think it just gave us all a real sense of appreciation, you know, for, oh, one thing I will say, there's a funny uh, thing that happened. Well, not so funny, but something that happened um, when my parents came to visit the set, they came for basically a weekend. And my uh, mother, of course, was, she's Polish. She's from Poland. Uh, my father was Russian. He's actually from Belarus, my father. We were in um, a hotel in a kind of a, a bar restaurant off of the lobby in one of the hotels. And this, my parents' visit happened to coincide with uh, several days of shooting. We had about a week of shooting with the actors who were playing the Russian partisans, right? So they were all real Russian actors from Russia. So my father, being from Belarus, Russian being his mother tongue, really connected with these Russian actors and they were having fun. And they were uh, sitting at the piano in this bar restaurant off of the lobby in the hotel. And um, my father started playing Russian folk tunes. And so they started singing Russian folk tunes and having a great old time. Well, let me tell you, we were in Lithuania. Lithuania, you know, uh, independent Lithuania doesn't exactly like the Russian language. You can understand how in that part of the world, language mattered. And it was like you could suddenly hear a pin drop. Everybody was staring. It was a very awkward, funny thing. Um, so they stopped. But uh, yeah, <laughs> but that was funny. <laughs> it sounds like they were having a good time, though, just not really reading the room. <laughs> they were having a Great time not reading the room, exactly. Yes, my my eighty five year old father was not not reading the room. <laughs> yeah, but it was fun. It was uh, it was fun to see that connection. And the other thing too is that it was fun to watch Daniel Craig ask my mother questions. You know, he um, Daniel is a very smart guy, and of course had read the book and knew all these details, and was asking her very detailed questions. You know, and um, that was really cool to see you know that was really wonderful it was fun for her also to be like a resource on set like that what did your mother think of the movie Uh, she loved it i think she really loved it she loved um seeing it come to life and i think she also felt you know she only met tuvia once i think she describes in the book how she met him and interviewed him only a few weeks before he died and she said he was 
incredibly charismatic even then as an old man who was uh, not physically in good shape. She still felt the charisma, and I think she really loved the way Daniel portrayed him uh, in film. I think she thought it was a great casting choice. Yeah, he's he's a great actor. <laughs> he is a great actor, yes. He really is, yeah. And all the actors in the film, I think, are really great, you know? Um, they really kind of in, inhabited their characters fully, so that was that was really cool, yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on to chat about Defiance. And for someone listening to this who wants to learn more about your work, can you tell us about what you do and share your website where they can learn more? Oh, sure. Yeah. So, well, um, I, I do make some films every once in a while. I keep keep my fingers in that, but um, I also do teach a lot. I teach writers uh, who are interested in filmmaking and playwriting. Um, and so you can just look me up at rollandtech.com and you can find more stuff there. Very good. I'll make sure to put a link to that in the show notes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right. This episode of Based on a True Story was produced by me, Dan LeFeb. I'd like to thank Roland Tech once again for taking the time to help us separate fact from fiction in 2008's Defiance. If you want to learn more about the real story, definitely go pick up Nahama Tech's book that the movie was based on, also called Defiance. And don't forget to check out Roland's work over at rolandtech.com. You can find a link to Nahama's book and Roland's work in the show notes for this episode. Of course, if you're driving or unable to check out the show notes right now, you can always find those links at any time on the show's home on the web, based on a true story podcast.com. Okay, now it's time for the answer to our two truths and a lie game from the beginning of the episode. And as a refresher, here are the two truths and one lie. Number one, there was not a fight between Tuvia and Zush that drove the brothers apart. Number two, crossing the swamp took a lot longer than we see in the movie. Number three, the Jews and the Russians did not work together at all like we see in the movie. Did you find out which one is a lie? Let's go in a completely random order and start in the middle with number two. Crossing the swamp took a lot longer than we see in the movie. That is true. Like a lot of movies, one of the differences from the true story was how the filmmakers condensed the timeline. While we see them crossing the swamp in a matter of minutes in the movie, in truth, it took them seven days. That brings us to number three. The Jews and the Russians did not work together at all like we see in the movie. That's the lie. In the movie, we see the Russian partisans doing a lot of the resistance against the Germans, blowing up railroad tracks, things like that. We also see the Jews in the camp helping the Russians by mending things for them and so on. And the truth is, that really happened. They really did work together to resist against the German occupation. That cooperation was thanks in no small part to the shrewd leadership of Tuvia Bielski. That means number one is also true. There was not a fight between Tuvia and Zush that drove the brothers apart. The tension between Tuvia and Zush Bielski in the movie that we see was a tool that the filmmakers used to really bring in the Russian partisans, who were, of course, very real. That just about wraps up our time together today. Before we go, the last thing I like to do on each episode is to share how much time and effort went into creating this episode. My hope in sharing this information is to go beyond just my podcast, but hopefully you'll start to appreciate all the podcasts that you listen to for free just a little bit more. Of course, I only have these stats for my own show. So with that said, today's episode took a total of 38 hours to create. And as I always do, I want to make it clear that it's only my time for this one episode. In other words, that 38 hours does not include any of my guest time researching the subject matter we talked about or you know, actually working on the movie. It also does not include the time that it takes for me to do podcast-related things that are not a part of creating this one single episode. For example, the time it takes to maintain the Based on a True Story website, uh, social media, the email newsletter, and all those other little things outside creating a single podcast episode that are still required to make an overall show. All those things take time to set up and maintain, and they cost money to go beyond the things that are associated with this one episode, but they're all things that are required because if I didn't do those things, then there wouldn't be any episodes of Based on a True Story at all. In a nutshell, this podcast may be free to listen to, but it is not free to create. And that's why I'm so thankful for the sponsors whose ads you've heard on this episode. You can find more information about them over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash advertisers. But they're not the only ones that are helping to keep the show alive. There are wonderful people just like you 
who are helping to keep this show financially going. So if you enjoyed today's episode, I hope you'll consider helping to support the next episode over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash support. And as a bonus, you'll get access to the producer's feed, which, as of this recording, has over 70 exclusive minisodes, as well as ad-free versions of the regular episodes, just like this one. You can find out how to get access to that by supporting the show over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash support. Once again, that's basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash support. Until next time, thanks so much for listening, and I'll chat with you again really soon.